wanted to introduce you to Mr. Barton Ross, for those that don't know him. And he has been acquired by the city of Scotch Plains to do architectural study work on the Shady Rest. And I'm proud to say that that's, this is one dollar that the Scotch Plains Township was well spent. Uh, Mr. Ross, a uh, very accredited architect, award-winning architect, has spent time and countless hours to survey the Shady Rest, the Shady Rest from top to bottom. And uh, we're going to now listen at his report as was brought to the town council in August of last year. And I thank him for volunteering to present the uh, study one more time. So I, without further ado, I'll give you Mr. Barton Ross. Here, here. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> test, test. They're both working, right? All right. All right, thank you all, and, uh, um, and yeah, I enjoy doing this, and I've really enjoyed working on this building. You know, it's a very fascinating building with, a, you know, an incredibly uh, steep history that, uh, you know, is kind of underrepresented. So, um, you know, I think this is definitely not just a Scotch Plains or a New Jersey, but a, a national treasure that uh, its story deserves to be told, and, uh, and it should be, you know, out there in the public more. So... So I'll um, quickly go through this. I don't want to, you know, be here all night, and uh, we'll leave time at the end. I'll explain um, the roof replacement project that we're doing now and a little bit of the future plans that we're hoping to get going uh, here when the, the weather warms up. Um, and also, um, well, that's, that's about it. We, we can have questions and answers at the end, too, if people have any specific questions. Mm -hmm. So we know where the building is, and I tried to darken this. I hope it's uh, readable. Uh, this is the executive summary I prepared uh, last year, explaining uh, what was actually done, the documentation, illustration, uh, what I was tasked to do as part of the request for proposals from Scotch Plains. And then these are the, the four things that I, I really was tasked to do, documentary research, on-site physical investigation, graphic documentation, and cost calculations. And those were based on the schematic uh, plans and the program that I was given by the town at the time, some of which has changed even since then. So, so the history of the building, um, you know, it's, it's an incredibly rich history. Uh, I only touched on, uh, you know, the, the bare surface, and even since I've I've done the report last year. Uh, people who helped me do the historic research have found more articles. I mean, it's, it's, it's really amazing how many um, pieces of information about the, the building, the Shady Rest, uh, about the uh, organization, and about the Mr. Shipman who lived there. Yeah. It's just a, a wealth of information that's out there. And I think we'll always still be learning more about it. So this process should never end. We should keep trying to, to learn and you know, presentations like this are very important to get that information out there. So I'll start with the, uh, the Tucker family who uh, built the Shady Rest, and they had a farm in that area uh, way, stretching all the way back to the early 1700s. And what they grew were uh, fruit orchards, apple orchards and things. And in the uh, pre-Civil War times, uh, apples and things would have been exported down to the south and as uh, you know brandy and things of this nature and so New Jersey was one of the important states for growing uh, th that type of crop and the hills of New Jersey lent itself to that you know this isn't flat country like you get out in the Midwest or the south uh, here's some images and these images are really invaluable for the next phase of what we want to do which is the exterior restoration uh, you can see how the building originally, this was the, the back porch, which has now all been filled over. Uh, you can see how there used to be the veranda out here where a lot of the activity took place. So we're hoping to kind of recreate that in some sense as we restore the building. Uh, and there's a lot of images where we can see how the old windows used to look from that side of the building because that's the side of the building that faced the golf course. So that's a very important elevation. 
Uh, obviously, when they had all these award presentations and the golf tournaments, all the action took place on that side. Uh, Sylvia found this neat photo. Um, and this is how we're going to try to restore the inside. So this is in the ballroom. Uh, this is a period picture. I'm not sure of the band. But you can see how the fireplace was actually parged over at one time. You can see how the wood floor used to go. It wasn't broken up like the ballroom like it is now with the pergo on the one side. Um, so this is how we try to restore it. You can see the brackets are still there, the recognizable brackets. You know, all that acoustic tile ceiling would go and we could have, you know, a plaster ceiling like it used to be or a drywall with plaster finish to recreate that look. Um, you know, it's black and white, so we can't tell the, the colors exactly, but we can kind of get the palette that it was a little darker here. It had, like, light baseboard. Obviously, all the trim was probably painted white. And this is what I was saying. There's still more articles. These weren't even included in the uh, preservation plan I did. <clears throat> more articles. Uh, national news. This was like Miami Herald, and I think uh, this was like the Cleveland Plain Dealer. So there's just, there was uh, a lot of articles all over the country published, especially in that early 1920s period, because this was such a, a groundbreaking organization. And so they all talk about how it's thriving after being open a year, you know, all the important people that have flocked to the uh, organization. Mr. Shippen obviously uh, could have his own lecture. And, you know, I think because his, his boyhood home has never been located, the, the one building that still stands in the United States that could most be associated with him is probably this building. So that should always be a connection. He was originally from uh, outside Washington, D.C., apparently. This is another image of him in later life. His nickname was Ship. Um, and this is from the PGA. I think it's important that the USGA, United States Golf Association, uh, have some kind of role in how we preserve the building. Uh, maybe they could, there could be some kind of a, a cross pollinization or transfer of like, you know, artifacts like the paintings or other pieces of memorabilia that could be on display, maybe loaned on display. Uh, there could be a, a permanent exhibit on Mr. Shippen. Maybe they have a permanent exhibit on Mr. Shippen. They're only now recognizing uh, his pioneering importance in, in golf in the United States. Uh, which is very important that he's been now recognized for his uh, contributions. And I think that's, that's a partnership that should be, you know, forged in the future more because, uh, you know, just because of his, uh, his stature in the, in the field of golf and that this is the building that has the tangible link to his legacy. Uh, this is Mr. Gordon, who was president in the 1920s, probably during the period of significance, he brought a lot of the uh, uh, the, the colored uh, tournaments that came to the Shady Rest. He oversaw all those, so he kind of had his own national stature in that field. And um, there are a lot of these photos of him standing in front of the building, also, which helped me immensely see how uh, the, the siding and the windows were put together. Um, so these are, these are very neat. It's, it's actually uh, pretty incredible how many images survived as we really delved into it. And, and we can take stills from the movies. So actually, most of these are actually stills that were taken from uh, Dr. Longdino's movie. Again, you can see how the building used to look when it just had uh, the single porch and the veranda that ran around with the, uh, the, the cross-headed uh, bottom here. Um, how the siding used to look when it was wood before it was covered over with vinyl. These are also stills from the movie, um, but they give you uh, a real sense of what it looked like. We found a lot of old maps. Uh, I thank the, the Terry's and the Historical Society. We found maps all the way back from pre-revolution times all the way up where even if it was just a dot such as this one drawn by a British officer in the Revolutionary War, we we get a you know, a sense where the building uh, always was. So there was always a Tucker farmhouse in that location. Whether it's exactly this building or not, 
that's up for debate, but their farm was always at this location in uh, mm -hmm. Scotch Plains. This is an 1850 map actually of Essex County, but it, it clearly shows uh, the Losey family, which took over after the Tuckers in the early 1800s. And this is uh, showing the, the Johnston family. This is uh, right after the Civil War era. And you can see all the, the, the orchards that would have been around. It's a, you know, very rural back then. All these are just farmsteads, and, and there's the house. This is a, a three-dimensional aerial view of Westfield from 1929, and unfortunately, the Shady Rest is just out of the picture here on Jerusalem Road. But this is really neat because it shows you kind of how the neighborhood looked at a particular period in time, 1929. And you can kind of see all the little, you know, story and a half gable houses that are, that are plopping up here. Um, as Westfield and Scotch Plains kind of fill in. This is the actual chain of title or the approximate chronology of all the occupants of the building. So Warner Tucker, we we're talking 1740s to 60s, and the architectural historian thinks that he, he was the builder. So he thinks that the stones that are under there actually date from 1740s even though what we found with the dendrochronology, which is the wood research, is that the house dated from around 1792. But it's very possible that, you know, it would have been a 50-year-old house at that time that they would have taken down the, the, the beams and, and, you know, reconstructed part of the house. You know, maybe it became, a, instead of a story and a half, it became a two and a half story. And back then, before Home Depot and Lowe's, you would have reused everything you had on site. So this is really neat. This is a 1798 will from Ephraim Tucker Sr. to Jr. And it explains all the meets and bounds for the property at that time, 1798. It definitely says that there was a house standing that he's giving to his son. Uh, so we know by 1798 that the house was there, like uh, definitively. And then in 1808, uh, it passed out of the Tucker family to the Losey family. And they're the ones you see through the rest of the 1800s. And around 1830s is when we think they enlarged the house to five bays and a center hall. This is the very important deed, uh, February 16th, 1923, the Westfield Golf Club Realty Company to the Progressive Realty Company. So I know in all the research it says 1921. I think it was just, it just took a while till they actually filed this with the county. And sometimes when deeds passed, this is not this is before computers. So it took many, many months before someone would actually like write it, scribe it in the book. So that's probably what happened here. And this is early 1923, February. So it had probably already long passed uh, over to the Progressive Realty Company. Uh, more articles. A lot of articles do focus on shipping, but that's that's good because it still always mentions the the shady rest. I'm hoping at some point we could transcribe all these articles and maybe they could be online or something and people could um, be able to search them for keywords or something. I think that would be very helpful. Uh, here's Dr. Longdino and some of the others who uh, really got this going in the early 1990s. This article is actually from 1991. Uh, here you can see Ella Fitzgerald, Count Basie. It'd be neat if we could actually find out like when they actually performed. Obviously that's uh, very difficult. It's not something I was able to locate, but uh, I think if we keep digging we could find some more solid information on when they might have actually performed based on their touring schedules. So the architectural history, I know it's hard to see. This is the Baker House, which was surveyed by the Historic American Building Survey, and this is a house that's contemporary with this one, um, and you can see even the, the gable pitch and the uh, chimney stacks, very similar. This is at the end of Jerusalem Road, right at Mountain Road. So right across Jerusalem at Mountain is this house, the Baker House. 
and you can kind of get a sense for how this was taken in the 1930s, how this house would have looked, because uh, this is an authentic one that's right down the street, another, another farmhouse. Obviously, the Shady Rest has undergone many, many transformations since then. And then I was pointing this out to uh, Mayor Glover and the manager today, the actual Roman numerals, which are an 18th century way the carpenters would scribe each of the different uh, pieces of wood when they had them laid out on the deck. And then that's how they would piece them together and then pull up one wall at a time. Kind of a forgotten art of building. These two postcards are very important because they show, especially this one, this, is, this would be the period of significance front image for how the parking lot side would have looked and how we'd like to restore it someday. So you can see the windows are missing here or they're covered over. Um, a lot of these window patterns are different. Uh, the front entrance is different. There was actually like a, a pro shop kind of uh, shed roof entry here. I don't know if we'd want to restore it exactly like that or not, if that would have a purpose, but you can see that here. This was actually just grass, so they had just parked on the grass back then. And then this is the inside, and these are the windows of the old Losi house, the back side of it. The veranda would have come around here on the outside. And this is where all the acoustic tile is today. And this line here, these windows, are where the columns are now in the dining room. And then it's bumped out even further here. So if you, this wall used to be a nice open wall with fenestration, with windows, and now you just have that uh, one solid hollow metal door that goes to the outside. You can even see the siding here. So it's possible these windows are encased inside the wall there. We don't know without taking the whole wall apart. But we can get a sense of how the room looked. We can get a sense of how the light fixtures looked. So all of these clues are very important when we go to restore it. And you can see here how... 1792 the house would have looked with its beehive oven uh, its tall chimney stack and the back side of this is where when you're in the ballroom today and you look back you see the molding and how it's you know kind of slanted down and that's the back side of the old fireplace here and that's why that structure has kind of sagged over time so it was probably just a one room or a one room with an unheated bedchamber originally and then the Losi family expanded it and made it uh, a center hall we know the floors weren't exactly the same, so it probably evolved more like the Baker House photo that you saw. Then by the end of the 1800s, it would have been a true five-bay colonial with a, a center hall stair that went upstairs. And the entry was still from the Jerusalem Road side, not from the parking lot side. There was no parking lot then. So then when Westfield Golf Club came, they needed parking. So of course the parking went up on the grass side where it was level and the building got switched. So now the door that used to be on this side is now on this side and it has been ever since. And Westfield Golf Club is the one who actually built the ballroom, the multi-purpose space that became more well known under the uh, progressive. This is the actual color that the clapboards were. It was a Cherokee red. Now, whether we restore it to that or not, uh, that's up to, you know, the town. <laughs> but uh, that is the color it was. That's not the color they painted. That's the color Westfield Golf Club painted it, that they inherited that color. Um, and it had an early asphalt roof. We're not sure of the color since it was black and white. So the building could stay white. I mean, I just think it needs to be wood clapboards, but the color, you can always repaint colors. So I think something that everybody uh, is, is happy with is more important than the actual color. Like, we know what it is, and that's, that's good enough. So. so you can see here in this photo, that's the Cherokee red. And this is when it was Westfield Golf Club and just about to be uh, passed over, you can see with the early cars. You can see here the... How it, the fenestration pattern, this is the, the, uh, the, the club building. You can see how the columns used to extend on the, the side of the house here facing Jerusalem before they built onto it. You can see these are the windows in that one postcard that you see looking back that got encased when the dining room got built out here. And you can see the color pattern was opposite what it is today. So you had a dark building with a white trim. And now it's kind of the other way around. You have a white building 
the vinyl, and you have uh, that dark blue turquoise color trim. So this is what we try to restore it to probably in terms of the color pattern, but we, could, we can play with that. And then I went through and did a whole assessment so that, uh, you know, you kind of have a point in time what the building looked like, how it operated, uh, its deficiencies, things that still worked, et cetera. You know, there, there's portions you can still see where the clapboards were. We inspected all the chimneys. I know these are hard to see. Um, if you crawl underneath the dining room in the back here, you can go all the way up and you can see the actual cornerstone here of the dressed stone that was the original foundation of the 1740s portion of the house. So it's really neat. And then right next to it, you can see how when they added onto the house and made it a five bay, they did not use stone, they used brick. So this would have been a cellar window that actually would have been a front window and now it's just kind of buried in the middle of the building. So that was really neat. You can only see it if you like crawl on your hands and knees and get in there. So. Uh, this is what the cellar looks like. There's some really neat uh, hearth supports down there. This is nine foot long. It's very big. This is an actual cooking fireplace that uh, possibly could have been used by a, a slave or a servant in the early 1800s or a family member nobody liked, so we don't know. But it was definitely down there, and it's, it's not a hearth support, so it's an actual cooking fireplace. So somebody down there in the basement would have used it uh, as, their, as their room. Uh, this is the architectural historian who went through the building. He's, he's very good. He's from Bergen County. Uh, and this is the dendrochronologist from uh, Columbia who actually drilled through all the wood pieces and got those core samples that he was able to compare with uh, samples that they had at Columbia. So the rest of the, the basement and the restrooms, they're all unisex restrooms. There's four of them now on the first floor. Obviously, if the building gets redone, we'd want uh, real restrooms, uh, a men's and a women's and a janitor closet, the old pro shop, uh, the dining room. And this, you can't see, but this is, this is the exact angle that that postcard is. So this is where those old windows were on the back before they built this porch out. And then where these columns are is actually where the first porch ended, and then they built the other one. And this is, this is that looking back in the dining room. Obviously, everyone know, uh, has heard or seen pictures of what the upstairs looks like at this point. And it's been condemned uh, many decades. And then we have Mr. Shippen's sink, uh, claw tub, and his toilet, which all say 1921. We got a little etching uh, underneath of them. So they're all up there. It's very hard to get up there to the third floor. We think Mr. Shippen probably had one of the large rooms up there, and maybe one of his best friends might have been up there with him. And then the second floor would have been more like the, the locker room for like the, the other pros and other people. So they kind of would have had the third floor as their own little private area. And so we think the third floor is where Mr. Shippen lived for 30 years. And it, it you know, you can tell it was it was neat back in the, the day, but uh, it definitely has um, worn tougher than, than a lot of the building. So the idea would be, how do we get, how do we let the public, you know, experience this? And that's what we'll be discussing moving forward. So, and then if you go all the way up to the attic, uh, it's really neat. All the old rafters are there, including the rafters from the 18th century portion, and then it distinctly stops, and then you have the, like, 1830s rafters, and they're very different. Uh, the older ones are hand-hewn, the newer ones are planed, and what we think is the house was probably a story and a half, and then when they raised it to two and a half stories, again, instead of going to a Home Depot or Lowe's, you just raised the whole roof with it. So that was a very neat discovery. These are all the surveys done by the DEP and Union County through the years. And there was about 10 of them, actually. So that was neat. This is the structural report that the structural engineer did. And he actually didn't think the building was as bad as uh, previously thought. Uh, obviously, the stone and the brick all has to be repointed on the foundation. The backside where the kitchen is is going to need to be reparged where the concrete foundation is. and. 
his major concern was just where the buildings have been added onto probably needs to be supported. So where the old building and where these porches were added mm -hmm. onto the back where the kitchen is now, we should support those. And he, he didn't think much of the second and third floor. He thought that they were pretty well beaten up at this point. Um, and just so everyone knows, the roof is actually pretty big. It's uh, 5,600 square feet for the whole roof. That includes all the little, the little parts on the side, the shed part. So it was bigger than we, we thought. And these are his photos. And then the inspector was very good. He came with a, a carpenter. So it was a carpenter and an electrical inspector. And they walked up and down. They spent about four hours with me, found many code violations, pointed all those out very succinctly in these photos. Um, and really, the biggest problem wasn't structural. It was electrical. So the electrical service was really the biggest issue in the building. All, a lot of these photos are electrical panels that aren't up to code. Uh, there was a lot of reverse polarity with uh, outlets. So it's a fire hazard. So we're looking into fixing that. Um, like I said, we had a paint analysis guy, uh, Chris Fry. He was very good. And that's the original colors he was able to determine, that it was uh, this dark Cherokee red would have been the actual siding. And then this cream color was the accents or the trim. The dendrochronology, this is what he actually shows. So on an, you have to find like an old piece of oak. You can't find a piece of wood that was like 10 years old. So you have to, we, we drilled into a very large piece that was down in the cellar, one of the rafters. And he, by, by going through his records, he's able to find like where droughts are because the rings grow at different intervals. So when you start piecing those together with other known events, he was able to pinpoint that in 1792, the tree, tree was felled. That's not when it was put in the building, but that's when it was felled. So it was probably utilized shortly thereafter. And he did this for a bunch of different samples. So this is the old asbestos report that was done on the inside, and they discovered that obviously in the plaster walls and in the cellar especially there was asbestos. I did a code study explaining um, how we would need an elevator to get upstairs if you want to have a space that nobody else uh, could utilize on a different floor. So let's say there's offices and the offices are only on the second or third floor. Then you need an elevator. If you put the off if there's an office on the first floor that somebody uh, with accessibility problems could utilize instead of using an office on the second and third floor, then it's okay. So you have to take those considerations into account. Obviously, if there's a museum and it's only on the third floor, then you're excluding some people and you're in violation of the code. Preservation philosophy, well, we divided it into treatment zones and treatment types and for the preservation plan. And we also touched on how we can follow the New Jersey Uniform Rehabilitation Subcode, which is very unique for New Jersey. It's great. You can get around certain code requirements if it's a historic eligible building, meaning it's eligible to be on the National Register of Historic Places or the State Register. Obviously, the Shady Rest is. So there's certain things we could get around in terms of, like, let's say you have a 36-inch high railing and you want to replace it with a 36-inch high railing. You don't want a 42-inch. You can do that if it's a historically eligible building. And there's four treatment types in preservation. There's a restoration, a rehabilitation, a adaptive reuse, and renovation or reconstruction. Um, most of the areas in the Shady Rest call for some type of rehabilitation so they can be utilized by the township. Also some areas of restoration. Um, and that, those are the two primary ones. The cost estimate that I prepared was based on program I was given by the township. So what they, you know, thought that the the building could be used for. Obviously, it's it's uh, the Parks and Rec is in charge of the building, so they kind of drove what the program would be. So this would be the like major rehabilitation one. So this is mostly what the floor plan. I know it's a little off kilter here. Looks like now. This would probably be more like if 
if we keep the outside the way it is, the way we'd want to actually restore it, which would be taking some of the pro shop and making real publicly accessible restrooms, restoring some of the dining room, trying to restore the veranda, moving the handicap accessibility from the front where it doesn't belong, maybe over to the side, so you could come up and enter on the side of the building and take advantage of the veranda, the old porch there. Also, the run for the uh, ramp would be a lot shorter on that side because the topography is higher, so that's good. And then restoring the kitchen, restoring the multi-purpose space, and then having some kind of a grand lobby that would be, you know, humbling in a way when you walk in that this is a, a really, you know, interesting historic building. These, these have gone by the wayside at this point. Um, and then the, the cost price, and this is obviously because it's government and prevailing wage, these prices are $3 million up to $5 million. And then these were the recommendations broken down by short term, and there was a list of about 40 items in the short term, which in the next six months need to be taken care of, like code violations, there was a tree on top of the fire hydrant, things like that, electrical problems, um, also the roof. And th these were the short-term fixes, and then we also broke out uh, the roof replacement, which we're doing now, and then more long-term things, which would be refinishing floors, um, new sump pumps, new lighting, new emergency lighting, security, new air conditioning, HVAC systems, all that type of thing. Those would be in the future. This was the program I was given. Not sure that would be anyone here's program. Um, and then we had uh, the summary based on, based on that. All the references, I thank everybody who, who helped me um, find resources, uh, old photos, old maps, much appreciated. Um, I, I was just telling Mr. Terry about the land researcher who did a great job. Uh, he found all the old plats going back to the early 1800s and about 300 pages worth, worth of uh, all the, the land deeds and titles over the years, which I put in the appendix that anybody could ever, you know, read through those if they wanted to. These are all the land records. Some are typed. You get back further, they're handwritten. And then, you know, how do we want to showcase Mr. Shippen and the Shady Rest? Kind of like here tonight. You have, you know, photos and information on some kind of posters, and how do we transfer that information to some kind of more permanent exhibit in the actual building. So when you go in there, you know, this is from the USGA, how they're portraying it. You know, I'm not an exhibit designer, but this is something that can really, you know, catch people's attention. And maybe school groups can even come through there. Um, you know, even when they do the jazzercise, maybe this could be around the ballroom so that you're, you're always cognizant of the history around you. I think that's an important consideration. This was a three-dimensional uh, of the building showing how the, the structure you have, these are joists, ceiling joists for the first floor, second floor, then you have rafters, uh, these are collar ties, then you have the chimney. This is the old ballroom, the old pro shop. So my idea was when you walk in, you know, this is, this is the period of significance entry it's not the historic entry, which was on the other side, but we're going to restore it to the period of significance from the 20s and 30s. And my idea was instead of coming through here with some kind of a escalator, elevator, that we just open it up so that you can see all the layers of architectural history in the building and how it evolved. You can see these different uh, rafters as you look up, and it's kind of a, a humbling experience, like walking into a church or a cathedral or something. And then we try to make the ballroom the historical focal point because, you know, that's where all these famous jazz greats played. Um, it's where they had all the balls, all the, the community gatherings, and this is kind of your the, the, the social, cultural history part of the building, and that's very important. And maybe this could be where around the walls or something, because we still want this room to be functional as a multi-purpose ballroom that the town could use. It should be used. I always say the best preserved building is the one that's still used. <laughs> so you want people in there all the time. And maybe when they're in there, you have this kind of exhibit all around. Maybe it's just plastered on all the walls around there. 
Mr. Shippen, the history of the building, the old photos, something so that when you're in there, you know, you feel like Count Basie and, and Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington and John Shippen, that they're all around you. The roof replacement, uh, we decided to go with this antique slate looking asphalt shingle. And it's kind of a darker color, but it's a, it's a very premium product. It should last decades and decades. This will be on only the gable roof portion. And this could kind of go with any color palette. So that's why it was chosen. It has nice clean lines that would match up to like if you had shingles, you know, this is the, this is the approximate size. So I think this will look very good. It has a thickness to it, so it doesn't have that like cheap asphalt look. It, it'll look like it has a, a tangible texture to it. These are the uh, aluminum downspouts that we chose. So they're half round to mimic the historic profile. They have these uh, clasps every 32 inches to also mimic like a historic wood profile. Obviously wood would have deteriorated too quickly and we didn't want to go with copper because it was very costly for the town and we didn't want it to be a target of people in the middle of the night to go you know, try to take it. So we decided to just go with innocuous white aluminum downspouts which will blend with the building. Um, but it, it has this historic profile and this historic look with the clasp. So it should just look like a nice traditional building. It'll have these uh, guards to keep all the leaves out of it uh, so the Parks and Rec guys aren't up there all the time cleaning it out. Where the flat roof portions are, are just going to have these traditional um, conductor heads. And the, it just comes off the flat roof here, and then it goes down the, the downspout. Um, and these will also just be white, so it'll be innocuously blended in with the, the clapboards. And then these are the drawings uh, I prepared for the roof replacement going back to last fall. These are just, this is just a sampling of what I did. This was the overall roof plan. This is, um, this is looking towards the parking lot. The parking lot's here. Jerusalem Road would be here. And you can see the, these are the different flat roof portions. We have this one. Then we have this one that stepped down. Then we have this one that stepped back up again. These are where all these HVAC ducts are up there. It's a real mess. Um, and this is where the gable roof portion of the old building is with the two chimneys. And then these are the two sides that are going to get the same asphalt shingle, so they kind of match. Um, all this HVAC is going to have to be picked up in place, then put back down after they do the flat roof. The flat roof is going to have a quarter inch pitch minimum. So it should, there should be no ponding, which was the problem before. So all this water is going to always be moving to an edge where it can go down a, a downspout in the gutter system. So that's the idea with that. And they're going to they're gonna demo all the old material off all the way down to the roof deck itself. And they're actually going to replace the deck. So this will be like, you know, erasing the 100 years of the, the built up. These are the elevations you can see. Not a lot will change um, from ground level when you look up. Obviously, all the, the gutters and downspouts will be nice and brand new for now, and the asphalt shingle uh, will be pretty visible. And, and we're, uh, I made them uh, reparge the chimneys, so uh, we, don't have, we, we don't have the budget at the moment to take apart the chimneys and repoint all the individual bricks, but uh, they'll at least reparge it, so it should stop the deterioration of the two chimneys. And then these are all the, the details. There were numerous sheets of this details. Uh, this was the advertisement for bid showing the schedule that we wanted to keep to. It, the original notice to proceed was January 15th. And then they have 60 days whenever we give them a notice to proceed. The problem is to do the flat roof, they need a consistent temperature of 35 degrees every day. So. Yeah, so it might be March or, you know, I'm, I'm hoping March. That's what they're hoping. So, so anyway, if anyone <laughs> wants to know why nothing's been done at the moment, that's why. So, um, As part of my fee, I paid for this, a new asbestos report, before we went out to bid, and we provide this to all the bidders. And there was asbestos found on two of the flat roofs, not on the back portion over the kitchen and not on the gable roof, but on the two sides, there was asbestos found. 
And these are what they do. They go up there and they scratch these little samples and that's how they, they, they dig all the way down to the deck. And then they go back and they, they test their fibers in a lab. So that's what we're doing with that. And then this is my, uh, this is a, a plug since I'm on the board of uh, Preservation New Jersey. And this year it's going to be at the Trenton Country Club, which is kind of a, it's a historic, uh, architecturally it's a historic uh, kind of twin to the Shady Rest. It was an old farmhouse that was converted uh, in the early 1900s into a golf club. And you can see how these, you know, these golf clubs uh, kind of evolved in the same way. Uh, and they also, they have this neat light fixture that hangs down here. So just some ideas and they have uh, a little more detailed uh, um, columns in the front. So it's, it's you know, it was at the time in the early 1900s that, that country clubs kind of all uh, kind of wanted to be Mount Vernon. So that's where this, this kind of came from, this like two-story, you know, colonnaded front. So, um, And the Shady Rest, uh, Miss Ethel Washington actually put it on Preservation New Jersey's um, list of endangered properties back in 2008. So I my hope is that it's kind of pricey if you want to go, but my, my hope is that, uh, you know, maybe when we get this restored, maybe like the 10-year anniversary that it was on there, like we have like a revisit of that. And, and since I'm on the board, obviously I can make that happen. And I, the, the most dangered list really gets a lot of press. Mm -hmm. And so I think this, the success stories get even more press. So I'm hoping this will be a nice success story that it was listed as an endangered uh, building and now it's been saved. So that concludes my presentation. Thanks.